Okay, so welcome to this next video on the playlist on functional analysis. Uh, in this video we are going to take a little bit of a detour and study some more theory of, um, of uh, metric spaces. Um, and uh, the topic we're going to take on is pseudometrics. Uh, because pseudometrics do pop up in analysis. Uh, and uh, one of the big topics we're going to look at uh, with relation to pseudometric spaces uh, is how do you convert a pseudometric space into a metric space. So firstly, let's see what a pseudometric space is then. So uh, the topic for this video is what is a pseudometric space? And uh, let's see an example of a pseudometric space so that we can understand why these things are going to be uh, important in our study of analysis. Pseudometric spaces. Okay, so a pseudometric space is very similar to a metric space. It is formally both a set, uh, so you have a set X, which is a set of elements. So let's take go back to our original example, which is a capital V, lowercase v, and capital F. So you have some set, uh, whatever set you want. It, this is a finite set. It could be a count of the infinite set. It could be an uncount of the infinite set. It can be whatever set you want. And it has a function, a, a distance function, again defined on the Cartesian product of x with itself. So uh, remember what the Cartesian product is. Uh, so if we take the Cartesian product of this set with itself, in fact, let's make it a smaller set so I don't have to write out this three by three table. Let's just make it capital phi and lowercase phi. Okay, so if you take the um, if you take the Cartesian product of a set uh, with itself, then basically what you do is you construct all ordered pairs. So why have I put that one first? This is capital phi, uh, lowercase phi here, capital phi here, and lowercase phi here. So basically, you put um, every element of the first set. Uh, so if you if you just had you can take the Cartesian product of any two sets, x and y, and what basically is it is, is it's a new set consisting of ordered pairs where any element you like or little x, where little x is an element of big X, can take it, can go in the first uh, space, and in the second space you can put any element of the other set. So basically, here is the first element of the first set, so let's put it in the first position, and then in the second position you can put any element of the second set. So capital V there, and then lowercase v. And then what we'll do is we'll say, let's put the other other element of the set, of the first set, in the first position, and we'll pair that with both elements of the second set. Uh, so when we get all possible ordered pairs of these of this set with itself, um, that's the Cartesian product. So it forms another set. It forms a set of ordered pairs. Okay, uh, so the distance function is going to act on this set, and it's going to map it onto uh, the positive real numbers, or rather the non-negative real numbers, and I keep making mistakes with that. Uh, the difference is between the positive and non-negative real numbers. The positive real numbers does, it doesn't include zero. The non-negative real numbers include zero. Uh, so non-negative means not negative, clearly. Uh, so zero is not a negative number, so zero is included in that. Uh, whereas positive means uh, strictly greater than zero, so uh, zero wouldn't be included in the positive real numbers. But we want zero to be included, so we should, I should say non-negative, but often I will make that mistake of saying positive rather than non-negative. Okay, so you, you ascribe uh, a real number to each of these, so this one will have a real number ascribed to it, uh, a non-negative real number ascribed to it, and each of them will have a non-negative real number ascribed to it. And it has two base maxims. You can't just um, ascribe whatever non-negative real numbers you like. Um, it's you work, well. You can you can create that structure, and you can you can write the theory of that sort of a structure if you want. But it won't be very interesting uh, if you want it to obey a lot of the uh, properties that we've seen in previous videos. Uh, so when we wanted to prove things about open balls and closed balls, and we wanted to prove that they were in fact open sets and closed sets, uh, we relied on the triangle inequality and properties of metric spaces. Uh, so uh, we, we want to conserve some of those axioms, So, um, but we won't have, the will one of the axioms of a metric space is not going to be present in a pseudo-metric space. So let's go through the axioms. So the first one of the metric space holds true, that the distance between any two elements, x and y, is a non-negative uh, real number. That holds true. Uh, so uh, you, uh, that property is usually called positivity. Oh, sorry, it shouldn't be called that. It should be called non-negativity. Non-negativity. So it's usually called non-negativity, not positivity. So you could call that property non-negativity. Okay, uh, so the second axiom is that the distance between an element and itself is equal to zero. 
Okay, uh, so that means that all of these diagonal terms are going to be mapped onto zero. Uh, so that still holds true in a pseudo-metric space. This now is the axiom that doesn't hold true in a metric space. In, an, in a normal metric space, uh, the second part of axiom two was that if, that if the distance between x and y was equal to zero, that needed to imply that x was equal to y. This was true in a metric space. We wanted this to be true in a metric space. So this was one of the axioms of metric spaces. So it was part two of axiom two. Uh, true in a metric space. And you know, we've uh, we've done a lot of examples of metric spaces, so I've shown you a lot of examples of how to check that this is true in uh, in metric spaces. Uh, but this is the axiom that is not going to be true in pseudo-metric spaces. And this, the name for this is um, positive, defin positive definiteness. Positive definiteness is the name for this axiom, part two of axiom two. Positive definiteness. And it means basically that if x is not equal to y, uh, then it implies that the distance between x and y is strictly greater than zero. I.e., if x, let me just write that down, if x is not equal to y, then it should imply that the distance between x and y is strictly positive, i.e., positively definite. That's where the name comes from. Basically, uh, in the pictorial sense over here, it means that. Uh, if you are on the diagonal, you are equal to zero, and if you are one of the off-diagonal uh, uh, ordered pairs, you are most definitely not equal to zero. So uh, these two elements cannot have a distance of zero, and these two elements have to have a distance of zero. Now in the pseudo-metric space, this part, part A of axiom 2, still holds true. So the diagonal elements are still ascribed to number zero, uh, but this part does not hold true. So the off-diagonal elements can be ascribed to uh, the value zero. So that uh, is the bit that goes in a uh, pseudo-metric space. So we do not insist on this in a pseudo-metric space. We do not insist on this in a pseudo-metric space. On this in a pseudo-metric space. Okay, uh, so now uh, that is not the full uh, set of axioms, because now we need to complete the set. Uh, so the other two axioms of metric space just hold true. So the third axiom of metric space was symmetry. The distance between x and y should be equal to the distance between y and x. That's saying that basically if I take the distance function acting on uh, an off-diagonal element, then the uh, symmetric, um, the um, well, if, if we look at this example, if if I take the distance of this bit here, it should be the same as the distance between this, uh, the distance of this one ascribed to this one, basically. So um, it should the distance function should be symmetric in the um, diagonal line. I if you take uh, the distance or if the distance ascribed to an ordered pair over here should be the same as the distance ascribed to its sort of its symmetric partner in the uh, in the or in the its. Basically, um, the distance function should be symmetric in the diagonal line. So if you have a ordered pair down here, take its symmetric one up here, and the distance uh, ascribed to that one should be the same as the distance ascribed to the one down here. Okay, that's basically what that says. And that's going to still hold true in a pseudo-metric space. Uh, so uh, that's called symmetry. Symmetry. And the final one, the um, one that makes metric spaces, and indeed is still true in pseudo-metric spaces, and it's the one that makes... Uh, it keeps it kind of intuitive, um, is the triangle inequality, which is that the distance between x and y should be less than or equal to the distance between x and z plus the distance between z and y. And if you want to know why that's called the triangle inequality, it's basically because if you uh, have two points x and y in the usual Euclidean plane, and you take a third point z, and you want to know um, what is the distance between x and y, well, what we do know, uh, so that's this part here, uh, corresponding to here, where are my pens? Uh, so this part here um, corresponds to this line here, okay? Uh, and if you, want, if you want to know, if you want some bound on how big that can be, well, basically, it's got to be less than the distance between x and z plus the distance between z and y. So the distance between x and z is this bit here, and the distance between z and y is this bit here. Uh, so it comes from the fact, from this geometrical fact about triangles, basically, that the um, 
the length of a single side of a triangle is less than or equal to the sum of the other two sides of a triangle. Okay, so all of these, uh, so this axiom again is still true in a pseudometric space, so the triangle inequality. So the only one that is not true in a pseudometric space is uh, part two of axiom two, this positive definiteness. So the off diagonal terms can now uh, equal zero in the, um, in the, um, in the, um, uh, in this Cartesian product table thing here. Okay, so I want to give you an example in this video of a pseudometric space. And uh, the pseudometric space is quite advanced. It's, um, it's a more difficult one to understand than normal ones. And the reason is it requires, uh, it requires the advanced theory of integration. It requires the theory of Lebesgue integration. So the um, metric space we're going to look at is uh, the uh, set, which is given this symbol, L01, which is the set of all functions, functions f, which map the interval 0 to 1 onto the real line such that uh, f is Lebesgue integrable. Now, um, intuitively, you can think of the Lebesgue integral as being almost exactly the same as the Riemann integral uh, in terms of um, in terms of any function that you will nearly ever have seen, uh, the Riemann integral and the Lebesgue integral are exactly the same thing. Uh, the Lebesgue integral can handle things that the Riemann integral can't, however. Uh, so when you have uh, sets which... Uh, so let, let me give you an example. If you have the interval 0 to 1, um, and you take the set of all rationals on there, in some sense that set... Um, has size zero. If you uh, if you want to actually measure it with a ruler, uh, each of the rationals is just a point, so it doesn't really it doesn't really consist of much. It just consists of points and a countable number of points. Whereas the whole interval has a length. Um, so in some sense, the rationals are a very very small part of this interval, and we want to reflect that. And the uh, Lebesgue integral can handle that. Um, so effectively, what the Lebesgue integral says, if if you have a function f defined on 0, 1, what the Lebesgue integral says is effectively, um, go, um, you go in, instead of splitting up the, um, the domain here, uh, in Riemann integration, what you do is you dissect up the domain into little bits, and, um, and then you sum up uh, the rectangles, the areas of the rectangles, so um, that you take the lower and upper Riemann sums. Uh, in the Lebesgue integral, what you do is you dissect up the codomain, and you say, okay, for each each um, each inverse image of the codomain, what is the size? And you um, use the Lebesgue measure. Um, what is the size of um, of the inverse image of that codomain? And then you uh, you work out rectangles from that basically, and you add it all up, and it works very beautifully. Uh, but in a way, it is very very similar to the concept of the ba of Riemann integration. And if you understand the concept of integration as area under the curve, uh, you can think of the Bayes integra integration as being exactly the same as Riemann integration, except that the Bayes integration can handle uh, these integrals where you have silly things like. Like um, you just have, you know, points that are different. Uh, uh, well, no, Riemann integration can handle single po a few po finite points that are different, but the Bayes integration can even handle countably infinitely many of those as long as their measure is still very very small. It handles that. Um, so it, it, it's only going to differ from Riemann integration when uh, you have some silly thing like that happening. Okay, um, so. Uh, this is a set of um, Lebesgue integrable functions, integrable, that should say. Uh, F is the great Lebesgue integrable, yeah. Uh, F is the Lebesgue integrable. So this is the set of all functions from the interval 0 to 1 onto the real line such that F is Lebesgue integrable. Okay? Uh, so... Um, so uh, we want to discuss why this uh, forms a pseudo-metric space, but I need to first tell you what the metric we're going to look at it uh, with is. So uh, the metric I'm going to define on it, so the distance between any function f and any function g, is just going to be the integral from 0 to 1, the Lebesgue integral now, uh, from 0 to 1 of the modulus of f minus g. Okay? Uh, so uh, 
again, this is, you might say, this is looking very similar to a problem we did a long time ago, where we took the set of continuous functions on 0 to 1, and we defined the metric exactly the same. And, you, and you're right, that, that formed a metric space. So why is this one forming a pseudo-metric space? And the way we were defining integration back on this set was by Riemann integration. And this set is very, very nicely behaved. Continuous functions are very, very nice, um, whereas the big integrable functions are much more general. And that's the reason this is going to form a pseudo-metric space, whereas this one formed a, a whole me a metric space uh, with the same metric effect of the on it. Because you could define uh, the integral as rather than being the Riemann integral, you could say, let's define it as the Beig integral. Uh, the metric will be exactly the same whether you define it as Riemann or the Beig integral, because the Beig and Riemann integrals for continuous functions are exactly the same. Um, okay, uh, so... Um, 0 to 1, the integral of the modulus of f minus g. So, uh, intuitively, we have our interval here, 0 to 1. We have some function here, and we have another function here, let's say. Uh, so, let's say uh, this up top one is f, and this bottom one is g. And basically, if we want to now plot what is f minus g, the modulus of f minus g, so basically we're just going to take f uh, well, we're going to take g from f and then take the modulus of that. In this case, I've drawn it very nicely so that f minus g is always positive, so the modulus doesn't actually change this. Uh, but it's going to look something like it's going to start off up here, it's going to get gradually bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It might get a bit smaller for a while, then go up a bit, and it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and then sort of finish out there somewhere. So it's not a very inter in interesting function, but intuitively what we're just doing is taking that difference and plotting it as a function of x okay and then what we're going to do is integrate this from 0 to 1 so intuitively what we're doing is taking the area underneath that okay and uh, so let's check that this satisfies the axioms of a uh, of a pseudometric space then so axiom 1 is that the distance between a function f and a function g should be a non-negative real number, so it should be between 0 and infinity. Okay, uh, so because we're integrating the modulus of a uh, of this f minus g, then we are assured that this function is everywhere non-negative, i.e. at the very worst this can be 0 somewhere, uh, or everywhere indeed, um, but uh, it's never going to be less than zero, it's never going to be negative, it's always going to be non-negative. So if you integrate a non-negative function, uh, clearly the integral is going, if you just think about it intuitively as the area under the curve, clearly the integral is not going to be um, negative, it's going to be non-negative. So you are going to get a value between zero and infinity. Okay, two. Uh, that's all the proof. I haven't proven that this is non-negative from the definition of the Beig integrable integration. But um, if you uh, want to see that, I um, I recommend a book on measure and integration. Okay, so two, uh, the distance. We we should do a play this on measure theory and integration. I started one, um, but I got bored. Um, let's. Uh, let's leave that because without going into the theory of the Beig integration in depth, it's, if, if the, the theory of the Beig integration is long and tedious, and uh, without going, f if you try just proving something like that, uh, then it would rely on a bunch of other results, and then those results would rely on other results, and it spreads out like a great pyramid, and you have to then just, uh, um, you know, you have to then talk about all of measure theory, and it's just no, we, we'd have to do a whole playlist on it. Okay, uh, so um, the distance between f and g is a non-negative real number. Uh, intuitively, that should be obvious. Um, so uh, now what we want to check is that the distance between a function and itself is actually equal to zero. Well, just plug in the definition. The distance between the function and itself is equal to this integral from zero to one of the modulus of f minus f dx. Now, whatever f is, if you, um, so if we draw a picture, uh, we have our interval 0, 1, and let's say this is our function f. Now if we subtract f from itself, then we just get the function 0, 0, 0 everywhere, this function here. So if we integrate the function 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, the area under that uh, is 0. So intuitively, again, this is going to be 0. Uh, so tick that result off. We have got that the distance between f and f is equal to 0. Okay, uh, now um, now we get the um, fact. Now we see the crucial moment. This is the crucial moment where we see 
uh, the reason that it does not obey positive definiteness and the reason this is not a metric space. And the reason it's not a metric space is because I can find you um, the dis I can find you two functions f and g which are distinct, um, which um, for which the distance between f and g is still equal uh, to uh, zero. And the reason is that's just uh, intuitively. Uh, there's a very simple example. The example everyone always uses uh, in the Bayes integration. Uh, so um, let's take f. Uh, in fact, let's let let's let g. Uh, be equal to zero everywhere. So in fact, it's just zero on all for all um, x is an element of zero one. So g is just the function zero everywhere, everywhere along that um, along that line. And let's say f is equal to the fancy term for it would be the indicator function of the rationals. And that means basically uh, that if I define it rigorously, it means that it's going to be equal to one if x is a rational number on 0 to 1, so we're only defining this on 0, 1, and it's going to be 0 if x is not a rational number, if x is not an element of the rational numbers. Okay, so intuitively the reason it's called an indicator function is that if it's 1, it indicates that the, um, the, val that the element of the domain that it took in was a rational, so it indicated that it was a rational, uh, and if it's 0, it indicates that it's not a rational, so that's why it's called an indicator function, and basically uh, we've um, this integral. Um, well, if we want to integrate, um, okay, let me just talk a bit more about this function f. Okay, so the function f is going to be zero on all the um, on all the non-rational numbers, on all the irrational numbers, and then it's going to be one on all of the rational numbers, and there are countably infinitely many rationals between 0 and 1. So it's 1 at a lot of places, but in some sense it's 0 at a lot more places than it is at 1, because it, there are uh, countably infinite many real numbers between 0 and 1. There are only countably many rationals, so it stands to reason, since you can't union two countable sets together and get another, um, uh, another, and um, sorry, you can't union two countable sets together and get a count and get an uncountable set. Uh, so the set of rationals is countable. Therefore, when we union it with the set of non-rationals, we get an uncountable set. Uh, so that set of non-rationals cannot be countable; it has to be uncountable. Uh, so there are, in some sense, a lot more ra non-rationals than there are rationals. And intuitively, we think that this integral between our, the integral of f dx between 0 and 1, we think of that as that should be 0, because it should take into account the fact that these rationals are kind of, they don't have any distance. They, the area under this is nothing, because they, you've only got points. You've only got countably many points. Uh, it's like saying, if I've got the integers here, and I... Um, if we spread this out, if you think about the integers from 0, all, the, all of the integers, 0, 1, uh, negative 2, 2, and uh, you then let it equal to 1 at every all of the integers, and then let it equal 0 everywhere else. If we integrate that, should we get anything? No, because it's just points. There's no area under it. Uh, this is a slightly more complicated examples, example because the rationals are so close together. They're, you know, you can get uh, rationals infinitesimally close together, to use that word that's not rigorous. But um, given any epsilon around any point, I can find you a rational within that epsilon neighborhood. Um, Okay, uh, it's, but it, the intuition for why this should be zero is similar to the intuition that this should be zero, that that has no area underneath it. Okay, uh, so um, if we now want to calculate, the, uh, firstly, let's acknowledge that f is not equal to g. Uh, very much so not. This is zero everywhere. This is one at a bunch of points. So f is not equal to g. Now, if we take the integral from zero to one of the modulus of f minus g dx, well, g is just 0 everywhere, so this just becomes the integral from 0 to 1 of the modulus of f dx, because taking away 0 doesn't change what f is. 
Um, and the modulus of f, f is non-negative everywhere, so taking its modulus doesn't affect it at all. So this just becomes the integral of f uh, dx, and we've agreed that this integral is equal to zero. So we have here that the distance between f and g is equal to zero, even though f is not equal to g. So this does not obey, obey positive definiteness, because I have found the two, two, uh, two um, elements of the, um, of the set uh, for which which are distinct, uh, but the distance between them is uh, equal to zero. So that's why it doesn't form a metric space, and that's um, that's the difference between this and when we saw C zero one, uh, because in C zero one you couldn't find two functions like this uh, where uh, the modulus of them uh, was uh, well. Uh, where the, their integral was equal to zero even though they were distinct. Uh, because they were continuous, you could not do that. Um, and basically, uh, to generalize this, any two functions, any two functions f and g, which are equal to one another, f is equal to g almost everywhere, and there's a very rigorous meaning which I'll try and explain to you in a moment, almost everywhere, will have the fact that the distance between f and g is equal to zero. So the meaning of almost everywhere equal to one another uh, means that uh, the set on which they are not equal to each other, in this case the set of rational numbers is where f is not equal to g. On all the non-rationals f is exactly equal to g, but on the rational numbers f is different. So the set of points in the uh, interval 0 to 1 uh, which the function on which the two functions are not equal to each other, that needs to be have the big measure 0 basically is the condition. That's what almost everywhere means. It means that this is true except on a set which is has the big measure 0. The rationals have the big measure 0. That's the intuitive way of saying that their length is 0. Um, so if you want to find out more about the big, uh, the big measure, I um, recommend uh, a textbook on measure and integration. We, we, I should do a playlist on that because it's a very important topic. Okay, um, so um, I think actually there is a playlist already on the internet on measure and integration by um, by NPTEL, the National Programme for Technology Enhanced Learning. If you type that into Google, I think there is a measure and integration playlist. Okay, um, and, and he will uh, he will go through this if. Uh, I think there is one. Yes, I think there is a measure and integration playlist in which he will discuss this at length. Uh, well, I presume he discusses this at length somewhere. Okay, uh, so uh, where were we? Okay, so now we just need to prove the other axioms of a pseudo-metric space. So we've seen that this cannot be a metric space, so, so we just want to confirm now that this does obey the other axioms of a uh, metric space. Okay, uh, so next axiom, the third axiom, is symmetry, that the distance between f and g should equal the distance between g and f. Well, this is a beautiful one, uh, because the integral between 0 and 1 of the modulus of f minus g dx is, of course, because the modulus function doesn't care which way you take this, so it's g minus f, the modulus of g minus f, uh, integrated between 0 and 1, which is just the definition of g, d, g, f. So it is symmetric. So we have a, a nice symmetric property. And finally, just the triangle inequality. The most, uh, usually the uh, most non trivial one, but in this case, obviously, our main focus was uh, the positive definiteness criterion. Okay, so the distance between f and g is equal to the integral between 0 and 1 of the modulus of f minus g dx. Now, uh, the modulus, uh, let, let, well, firstly, let's let h be another element of our. Uh, set of the big integrable functions on 0, 1. Uh, we, what we know from basic uh, real analysis is that the modulus of f, uh, sorry, the modulus of a plus b is less than or equal to the modulus of a plus the modulus of b. So basically, if we view, what we can say is we can say that f minus g is equal to the modulus of f minus h plus h minus g, and then basically what we do is we view a as being f minus h and b as being h minus g, and we therefore get that this is less than or equal to f minus h plus the modulus of h minus g. So uh, if you if you integrate, uh, so if we integrate 0 to 1 of, uh, let's say, f minus h plus h minus g dx, which is just equal to this integral here, it, because this is less than or equal to ev everywhere, this is true everywhere, for all x is an element of the interval 0 to 1, uh, it's true that this is less than or equal to this, uh, then that implies that this integral is less than or equal to 
uh, this integral. And again, this is something that's not too difficult to show. It will be proved in a, in a um, course on advanced real analysis where they discuss the theory of integration. Uh, but you certainly prove this for Riemann integration, so uh, it follows for the Bayes integration as well. Uh, so this is uh, less than or equal to the integral of the modulus of f minus h plus uh, the modulus of h minus g dx, and then we just uh, use linearity of the integral, uh, so that this is the integral from 0 to 1 of the modulus of f minus h dx, plus the integral from 0 to 1 of um, modulus of h minus g uh, dx. And then this is just the, in, uh, the definition of the distance between f and h, and this is just the definition of distance between h and g. Uh, so we get the triangle inequality from that. So what we've seen here is an example of a pseudometric space and in the next video what we'll do is we'll talk about how we can convert pseudometric spaces into metric spaces.